Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in to Season 2, Episode 2 of the Straight Out of Prison Podcast. My name is James K. Jones and this is my story. And I am Haley Jones and this is his story that has now become a part of my story. So we ended the last one. I got out of prison in Florida. I came to Montgomery County. A hellish travel. Getting there took me three or four days. Rode through my hometown, sitting at a red light. I couldn't see it, but I knew my mama's house was on the other side of those trees. And just coming to the end of myself, just like, I'm just ready to die. Well, and then you got there and felt like you got an injection of hope seeing that you had bond, and which meant that you could potentially get out. Not forever, maybe. I mean, but... Even just the thought for you of getting out for a day was was yeah anything crazy. Like I, I got I could go home and that you for like the way that like shot me up in my emotions like because if you remember talking about all my other county jail experiences I always had an HWOB which meant hold without bond and here in Montgomery County they gave me a ten thousand dollar bond which meant I mean anybody in my family could have posted a bond for that so that euphoric like rise of like, I'm going home and then setting it up and getting ready to go. And then the just the the total, like, downer of realizing that I had charges all over Alabama and the sheriff in Russell County advising my aunt. Like, there's no reason to bond him out because if you get him out, now he's going to go somewhere else. And it's just going to be a endless cycle. You might as well just let him sit there. And then just that hopeless, like, feeling – that led me to doing something else. Well, and I've heard it said that when you your highest of high meets your lowest of low. So that's why people, some people avoid emotion because you don't want to get too excited and happy because then you're going to crash or the opposite. So for you, that was true. I mean, just that height of hope only yeah. to bring it down to the lowest of low because you had experienced the high and was the, devastating. And the low that I experienced after that was, you know, I, at this time I've been locked up for three years and six months, but I had never been locked up under the conditions that I was locked up under. This was a nasty place I was in. Oh, yeah, because you said it was not as well kept as the Florida prisons or jails. Well, in, in Florida they had like, it was like they had rules. Um, they had to take care of you. They had to feed you. They had to... Make sure you had a bed. Uh, in Alabama, they didn't seem to have any of these rules. Right. So you ended up in a room with 50 guys with a mat on the floor. It was actually closer to 60, but it was a, a cell block that was designed for, I think it was 18 men was the design. Okay. So there were two toilets, two sinks, two showers. For 50 to 60 men. It was over 50. It was closer to 60 men that was in there. So you were sleeping on a mat on the floor under the stairs in this now. I mean, what you said last time really stuck with me is that just the smell of that many men in a prison. And we're in, I mean, we're in Alabama and there was no air conditioning. Uh, I think they had AC, but it was, this was July. They didn't really run it. Like, okay. It's not like, you know, how you put our air on 66 and I tell you to stop and put on 70. 68 when 68. we're sleeping. Yes. Whatever. I just know it runs <laughs> the power bill up. But uh, they didn't uh, They didn't do that there. But even even if they had it set on 50, you know, you, you squish like 60 people into a, conf- a little confinement like that. It is, um, it's a recipe for disaster. There was just the tension. You could cut it with a knife. There was a lot of gang activity and gang members in there and and honestly i'd never seen anything like that in florida you didn't really see it. i mean i guess there were gangs but the camp that i was at i never saw gangs i just saw like homeboys like if you're from jacksonville you know you hung together if you're from from day county which is miami or broward county um which was fort lauderdale those those guys kind of hung together but I never really saw the gang stuff like i saw in montgomery and it was terrifying just the you know my first couple of hours in there, I saw a guy get beat down and his face split open just for no reason, just because he disrespected somebody. Mm-hmm. So it was a, it's a pretty, it was a pretty disgusting place to be. But then we talked about in the last one, the thing that would never happen to me happened. Um, I had to come to Jesus. <laughs> a literal come to Jesus. No, it was real. Or maybe Jesus came to you. Well, looking back on it now, I know that God had been chasing me 
for years, and I even believe my whole life, like he's had his hand on me. But at that time, I didn't believe in any of that stuff. I didn't believe in any of the get saved or any of that stuff. Yeah, because you had said in the last end of the last season, you about your soul awakening in yeah. Florida before you left. That was more of a like if you use like the the literal terms now. I think I went from being an atheist because I was a stone cold atheist. Like I I don't I have no problem knowing that. Like I knew there was nothing else but me and what I could get away with. But I came to. It was John, Ma- John, not John Maxwell, John Wesley, who defined it as a soul awakening moment. And yeah. he was in the 1800s. He was, I mean, I've studied all his writings and stuff. Like, I really admire him. He was a guy that grew up religious. He was a, in England. He was an Anglican. And so, which was a, would be our American version of an Episcopalian. Mm-hmm. He did all the rituals, did all the things, had all the religion, but he was missing something. So he went on a missionary journey to the colony of Georgia. And the thing that they were supposed to do during those times was to make the Indians become believers. But the way that they would make the Indians believe in Jesus was to pull a gun on them and say, confess Christ or die. <laughs> so they were like, Stressful. I love Jesus. I think I would <laughs> Praise the Jesus. do what they were telling me to so, do. So, but he did two or three, I think, well, two or three, I can't remember. He did, I know at least two, like missionary journeys to Georgia. And his last one, he would just get so, he was so frustrated with his life and his faith and the church and all the things. And he was on a ship going back to England and he heard a small group of, uh, I think they were called Moravians. I don't know the significance of that. I just remember the name. But they were, like, not part of the big church. Like, they were just a small group of Jesus followers. And he heard them singing a song on the ship about the blood of Jesus and salvation. And there was something in him that just came alive where he was like, whatever they have, I need to have that because I have religion, you know. And I think he was, like, confirmed in the church and had all the you know, robes and rings and sandals or whatever they gave him in those days. <laughs> but uh, he knew that something went right, and he came to a soul awakening moment, which led to a, a genuine salvation experience with him where he met Jesus through his spirit face-to-face, and it changed his life. And then he went back to England and started preaching, and they kicked him out of the church and told him, you know, we don't want to hear all that. But uh, he knew what he had was real, and he kept at it, and you know, his influence, his writings, the, uh, I guess, the churches he started, I mean, that's flooded the world up to this day. And that was kind of what happened to me. I was not religious, wasn't looking for religion. And, you know, 24 years in, I'm still not looking for religion. What I experienced in that dirty little jail cell was Jesus Christ, through his spirit, coming to me, telling me, all you got to do is give up and ask me to come in, and then just trust me. Come unto me. Come to me. I got you. Just trust me. And, you know, I came to the end of that long night where I surrendered, and I gave up, and I said, I give up. Come in. And he did, and when he did, my heart was changed. And I don't even, I don't even like to say my heart was changed. It was like there was something inside of me that had been dead all my life that came alive. In that time, and I knew it. I knew it as much as I know that my hands are on the end of my arms, and nobody could take that from me. And it changed everything about me from that day forward. It's kind of neat because, as you describe that, and as we've been talking about, even outside of this podcast, is hearing your story. Me, I mean, this is the first time I've heard it chronologically in this much detail. But hearing the details of who you who you were and how you behaved and just kind of some of the things that you did, it's that you're the same person then when you were criminal that you are now as far as like the gifts that you have and how you. But you're also completely different because of the heart change. Well, I guess the way I see it, like God creates us, like we're created, like no matter what your belief is. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, and we are the capstone of his creation. So any creation that you could look at and say, ooh, look at that, you know, mountain or, you know, the universe or Jupiter or Mars, we are, according to the Scripture, we're the capstone of that. We're the top of that. Like, we are 
the pinnacle of creation. And he actually breathes a part of us in a, a part of himself in us, because whether we ever come to him or not, it is clear that we are created in the image of God. So that just in and of itself is a fascinating thing. And I believe that your personality, like who you are and your gifts and talents are how you're born. Now, whether you're ever like redeemed or come to Jesus and and get that salvation and he's able to activate all that stuff is regardless, you're going to be who you are. I mean, Jesus never said, I don't want you to be who you are. I just want to change your heart and your motivations and give you my spirit and put myself in you so I can live through you. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's neat. I mean, from my perspective to hear your story and then as to know you as intimately as I do now and to be able to see and feel the things that are the same and the things that are totally different. So you got saved. I liked how you... I still don't like using that. I know, but you said that last time. Even though the Bible says that, I just, it's like so many people have like taken that and abused it so much. Yeah. I mean, I don't even really call myself Christian. I call myself a follower of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though, you know, I am a Christian. So the part of you that was dead came alive because you asked Jesus to come in, right? Yes. And then, but the next day... I mean, my circumstances did not change. Well, that was my question. So you woke up. You oh, well, first, you said you slept better. You don't even know how you slept because you had the best sleep of your life. That after first that. night, yes, it was like I woke up thinking, "How did I ever sleep without you?" Right. <laughs> <laughs> and plus, I was in a violent place where somebody could have stomped my eyes out while I was asleep. Right. And it was. I mean, that was a reality. And the correctional officer, the police there, they didn't care. I mean, I guess they care. I shouldn't say they didn't care. But they didn't really do anything about the gang stuff. Like if somebody got beat down like that, they wouldn't even address it. They would just take the person out and, you know, tend to their wounds and move on. So you woke up the next morning. Then what? It was crazy. I was full of life, and it was a life that I'd never experienced before. It was a peace that I'd never experienced, a joy that I'd never experienced before. And don't get me wrong, nobody wants to be locked up in jail or prison. You know, we were not created for that. But there was something about that next day. I was I was changed. I was different. Now, I did have this, um, I don't know if it was weird or if it was just how the way I grew up, I felt like I had this understanding with Jesus, like, surely you're not asking me to go to church. Like, you know, I'm not going to do church and, (laughs) you know, put on the pleated khaki pants and tuck my shirt in and put a tie on. Like, I'm not, you know, that's not, I'm not going to do all that. Waking up that next day, I felt like I need to make this, like, official. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. And I don't even know why I thought that. I just knew, okay, this was me and Jesus. This thing happened. Like, I need to make it official. Well, it's like anything else. I think we instinctively, if something big happens and you know something big has happened, you almost need to, like, confirm it. (laughs) Yeah, and I didn't even really know how. Yeah. But I knew they had chapel call. I'd heard them. And so I said, next time they say chapel call, I'm going to go to chapel call. So I think it was the second or third day they did a chapel call and I was first in line. And I marched myself, I marched myself down to the little chapel, and you know there might have been ten or twelve guys there. I didn't know what I was doing, um, but I felt like I needed to, you know, make it official. So I just uh, went, sat through the little service they did, and then explained to the chaplain, you know, what I felt like happened to me. And he was like, "Well, son, you've you've experienced salvation, but to make it." real uh the scripture is clear you have to do a public profession of faith and so i was like well what does that mean and he was he said well you you gotta stand up in front of everybody and confess jesus as lord so i was like okay well what do we need to do to make that happen and so he gave me like this little piece of paper and i stood up and said you know i believe that jesus christ is the son of god i believe that god raised him from the dead i ask him to come into my heart and i make him lord of my life and then he said you're saved so I was like, okay, I mean, you say that, but what happened to me two days ago in the jail cell kind of pales in comparison to this little checkbox okay, or whatever. Okay, so did you think that at the time? I know you think that now, but it was that the thought that came into your mind at Absolutely. the time? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, I felt like, okay, we're doing a religious thing, and I don't really want anything to do with that. 
I mean, I'll do it because I feel like I'm supposed to. And, I, you know, I have been reading the Bible for like two days by then. <laughs> I was a Bible scholar already. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, I needed some guidance. I needed some input. I needed to know what to do next. And he told me that was what I was supposed to do. And in those days, I hated, like I despised standing up in front of people and talking. I couldn't stand it. But that was what I was supposed to do, so that was what I did. I just sucked it up and did it. And then he said, um, and this was a sweet man. He was a good man. I would get to like him better over the next six months while I was there. He said, well, son, have you been baptized? And I said, no. And so he said, he like pulled me off from everybody else, and he was like, come back here. And he took me into this little jailhouse slash prison bathroom, and it was like a little... 100 square feet, a little metal toilet, and then a, one of those metal sinks, a little mirror. And he said, well, I'm going to baptize you in here. And I was like, okay, but, you know, I, I thought you, like, dunked you or whatever. Because I'd seen people get baptized before. I never really knew what it meant. He, like, grabbed me up and he said, son, don't worry about how we're doing it. God meets us where we're at, and he's meeting us here today. And he said, um, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And I said, yes. He said, do you believe that he died for your sins and that God raised him from the dead? And I said, yes. And he said, all right, I want you to put your head over the little sink. And then he filled his hands up with water. And he said, because of your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And he like had a handful of water and he like splashed it on my head. And it was just the weirdest like feeling of like, what are you doing? Like I felt so awkward. You know, I'm half wet. Like, like if you're all the way wet, you feel some kind of way. But if you're just like half wet, you feel just awkward. And and I had on my little orange prison suit, and I was, you know, head was wet, dripping down on me. And then he like grabbed me up in a bear hug and was like, "Everything's going to be better now." And I just remember thinking, "How was anything?" I mean, <laughs> like, I mean, I understand it now, but I didn't understand it then. Like, whatever. Whatever you think and you, like, put me over a prison sink and wet my head is going to do <laughs> really, like, paled in comparison to what happened to me, you know, three days prior in that nasty jail cell. So then what happened next was even though I was, like, anti-church, every time they called chapel, I felt like I needed to go because I had, like, this, I want to make sure. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And then... Well, was there a feeling of, like, you didn't want to lose what happened or... yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have, like, any guidance. And he didn't give me any guidance except for to say a, a confession of faith, and then he was going to wet my head and baptize me. And then prison or jail, like, services that you go to, is they're all, like, salvation-oriented. So all they're going to talk about is you need Jesus, you need Jesus, you need Jesus. And, you know, they get to the end of every one of those, and then they will say, you know, bow your head, close your eyes, raise your hand if you need to be saved, and then come up front, and we'll do the prayer. So every time I went, I would do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. I was trying to make sure it took. Well, it's fine. <laughs> make sure it took. And it's funny, like, knowing you like I do, I know that you probably were just really wanting, like, okay, like you have already said, what do I do now? Give me some next steps. Like, give me something to do. Obviously, something happened, and now I feel like I need to do the next thing. Well, I didn't know. Like, I mean, I grew up, like, my Mima was very re- religious as far as Free Will Baptist, and she was a good person, and she loved Jesus. Like, remember me telling you, like, that they told me at youth camp that she was sinning because she dipped snuff? Oh, yeah. And I remember going home after that and her telling me, and she says, Sonny boy, I just need to tell you, the Lord gives us a conscience, and I have begged the Lord to take the snuff from me, but he hadn't took it from me, so he's okay with it, so I'm going to dip my snuff. <laughs> and But it made sense. It was like, well, if God don't want you to do it, I guess he would help you, and he didn't help her not dip snuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but there was some of that. That was the only like frame of reference I had for any kind of like spiritual anything that was my only thing on my dad's side of the family my granny and my grandfather they only went to church like if somebody got married if somebody died and then like easter like we didn't even go on christmas there was not it was not a lot of and later on i'd understand she got hurt really bad by the church when she was young 
And, you know, she had to come to Jesus in, when she was 88 years old, right before she died, which was beautiful. But uh, I didn't know. I didn't know what I was doing. Like, anyways, this chaplain, this uh, jail chaplain in Montgomery, he got aggravated with me. And he, he like, was like, look, you don't have to come up here every time and do the confession. <laughs> And so I was like, well, I didn't know. I mean, I'm trying to, you know, you said if you felt convicted, I feel convicted. But that was like three or four weeks in, and um, he was trying to guide me, and he did a good job. He, like, would always send me back to the scriptures, you know, read the Bible, learn. Uh, He gave me some books. It was a process, but in the beginning, for me, it was so simple because I didn't, it wasn't clouded with, like, rules, regulations, any of that stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. And for me, it was like, I felt like, okay, well, if I sin, the only sins I have is smoking cigarettes and masturbating. (laughs) So if I can, like, not smoke cigarettes and not masturbate, I'm holy. I'm good. (laughs) And that was a a non-smoking facility, so we didn't have cigarettes, so that was not a... that knocked that one out. (laughs) Yeah, that was easy. That was an easy one. But then, you know, the masturbating stuff, that was hard because that was how I took care of myself. (laughs) I mean, I was only 24 years old. I even feel embarrassed hearing this right now. I'm just trying to be real. Um, (laughs) I'm just trying to be real. But that was my, those were my struggles. And then I asked my, I explained to my mom what happened to me. And, you know, she did not have a good initial reaction. She thought I had like some kind of jailhouse religion. And she was, like, telling me, like, that's, you know, baby, that's, like, things that you don't you don't play with that. And so I was like, no, Mom, you don't understand this is real. Like, this, this happened. And so she supported me as best she could, but she didn't really understand what happened to me. Well, you said nobody believed you. I no. So. I, well, my mama did. My, yeah. my mama's mom. She was overjoyed. She told me that she always knew I was going to be a preacher and you're like on the phone, like I always knew you were gonna be a preacher, and I was like, hold up, hold up, nobody's saying that. Like, <laughs> no, that's not what we're talking about. And then as I started reading the scriptures, like I wanted to, it was like I couldn't stop reading and devouring the words of Jesus. Like it just, I just wanted more of it. And then I, I remembered the guy that told me to read the gospels. I was reading through the gospels, and then he also told me he said. um, You know, there's 31 days usually in a month, and there's 31 books of Proverbs, so you should read a proverb every day. Like, if it's the first of the month, you should read chapter 1. And I started doing that, and I just remember during that time, like, I would read through the scriptures, and it would just make me cry. Like, I I couldn't stop crying because I just felt so stupid. Like, I've ruined my life, and this was here all the time, and it was kind of like a truth that I'd always been looking for. But I didn't know to look there because the way that, I guess, like religion had painted it in such an ugly picture for me that I couldn't, I I couldn't, I'm not doing that. I'm not fooling with that. I was so anti anything Jesus. Like I would have been more likely to become like a Buddhist or Muslim or some other, you know, like new age person than I would be to ever become like a, a Jesus follower. So that in and of itself even now, looking back on it, that's a miracle. That was a miracle, just because of my mindset, the way I thought, and the way I grew up, in the, and, you know, just the abuse I experienced in church. Like, mm-hmm. there was nothing in church for me. That you wanted. No. So you were changed. All that was going on. So I know from you, from p- the previous part of the story, you're in the jail now, you're waiting for a court date and a sentencing, is that right? Yeah. What, well, what was st- going on with all you st- that? You start the process over. So okay. now I'm charged. I have an armed robbery charge in Montgomery. It was actually two armed robbery charges because we did two in Montgomery. You just have to start the process over. So I was appointed a public defender because it's still at that time it was like twenty, thirty grand to represent me, and nobody had that kind of money. Montgomery was different from like Jefferson County or Bay County where it was. Like they had like real lawyers that would had to take a certain amount of pro bono cases. And so I got this lawyer. I can't remember his, his last name was DeBell DeBar DeLynn. <laughs> DeBar DeLabin? De, I don't know. It was D-Bell DeBar DeBaden. I could never say his name. <laughs> I just called him Mr. D. I mean, I didn't know okay. what to call him. Um, but he was like a real lawyer. 
And he was like fighting for me like a real lawyer. But I remember the first time I sat down with him after I'd had this experience with Jesus, like realizing you got to tell him the truth. And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, I had all these stories, <laughs> you know, it's going to be not good if I tell the truth. <laughs> but I did. I just I leveled with him. I told him the truth. And um, he came back with an offer from the DA of 20 years. And I was like, 20 years? But that, 20 years in prison? That was what they wanted to give me in Montgomery. I mean, I had two Class A felonies, two armed robberies. But just he uh, he wanted to help me. And I kind of accepted responsibility. I told the truth. You know, this is what we did. I'm, I mean, I probably played off the little drug thing a little more than it was true, you know. The drugs made me do it oh, kind of yeah. thing. But uh, he was a good guy. He met with me at least once a week. He'd come and see me. We'd, like, try to talk through things. And it was just hard to realize, like, okay, now i got to tell the truth, and I'm stuck, and they could send me to prison for life, you know, for this stuff. And uh, it was uh, very uh, sobering. But at the same time, I had a different, I guess, outlook. Like I had perspective. I had hope. I didn't, know, I didn't even know why I had hope. Like my mom was like, are you crazy? Yeah, especially, I mean, good thing you had hope because right after they tell you you have 20 20- more years you get sentenced. That was what I was looking at, 20 years. Yeah. But then um, the craziest thing began to happen in that nasty, dirty, like, unit that I was in. I started reading the Bible. I asked my mom, you know, I need you to get me a real Bible because they could, like, send you stuff. And I told her it had to be a new international version. I don't want none of that King James nonsense. I need something I can read. And, you know, she always supported me in that way. Anything I said I needed, like books or Bibles or any of that stuff, she went and got it. Um, this is the first time you asked for a Bible, though. Oh, I'd never asked for a Bible. I was going to say, unless you asked for it to roll it up to smoke it or something. Well, Bibles are like a not a commodity in prison or jail. They're everywhere. Okay. But, like you got all the denominations, all the people, they're always like dropping off Bibles. Oh, okay. So Bibles were not. Hard to come by. Mm-hmm. But I wanted my own Bible. Yeah. Because I wanted to study. And she bought me a, like an NIV Bible, but she bought it with a hard cover, like a hard cover Bible. Mm-hmm. I guess you probably don't know this, but you can't have hard cover books in jail. Okay. You can only have paperbacks. So she they she brought the hard the hardcover NIV Bible and um they told her I couldn't have it and she was so distraught that they just ripped the cover off <laughs> and gave it to me. And then that was my first Bible that I studied. Do you still have that Bible? No, I think that got, that one got lost in transit. But it was just, it was just a regular Bible. It didn't have a concordance or anything in it. And I was just basically just reading it and devouring it. And I started reading it, and there was a guy that had a mat on the floor next to me. His name was Clarence. He was from Verbena, Alabama. You know, if you're traveling down 65, you pass by Verbena. Yeah. I always think of him when I see that and wonder what happened to him. But... uh he was a little bit older than me, a uh, black guy, and uh, just asked me what I was reading. And I said, well, you know, I was kind of a little ashamed because I didn't, I didn't think anybody would believe me. You know, I'm me. <laughs> this, this can't be happening to me. But it was real to me, but it was like I didn't really want to exp- – it was hard to, like, communicate that to other people. And so he uh, was like, I know you've been reading. What have you been reading? And I said, well, I had – I had an experience with Jesus, you know, a couple of days ago, and this stuff is for real. And he was like, tell me more. And so I said, I don't know. I had like this presence. <laughs> and he told me to give up, and he come in. I gave up, he came in, and now I can't stop reading this these words. And uh, he started studying with me. And another guy came. He started studying with us. And then another guy and then another guy The next thing I knew, you look up and there's 15 of us that are like studying the Bible and like trying. None of us knew what we were doing. Okay. (laughs) None of us. We didn't know anything about nothing. We were all just, you know, we locked up without hope (laughs) in the Montgomery County Jail in the nastiest place on earth, you know. And we started studying and then it was like more people started coming. And this turned into an all day type of deal. Like, there are guys that would come in, and, you know, I remember there was one guy, Darby. He was like, he grew up in church, but he had been 
said he said he was backslidden, whatever that means. And you know, he had, you know, just by being there, he decided to recommit his life to Jesus and do all the things. And he knew like some stuff he would try to teach us. And then there was a guy named Frank that was from Chicago. He was a uh, he was like one of those guys who's real smart, almost too smart. But he he said he was a believer, but that he was also a Muslim. So I was like, okay, well, I mean, how does that, how do you connect those two? And then he explained to me, like, you know, Abraham had two sons. One was Ishmael, one was Isaac. The Jews came from Isaac, but the Muslims came from Ishmael. So I was like, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know all that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So I would go and, like, then I started studying the book of Genesis. Like, I need to know who Isaac is and who Ishmael is and all that stuff. And um, well, let me pause you. Did the, these guys that started studying? Did they then have the same experience that you had? Some of them did, like really did. Um, I'm not sure about all of them, but they were all participating mm-hmm. in what we were doing, and we didn't even know what we were doing. And then, like this Darby guy came along, and was like, "Well, you know, God wants you to worship Him," and I was like. Okay, what does that mean? You know, okay, what does that mean? And so he was teaching us, like, all the old, like, African-American gospel hymns. And so we were learning these songs, and we would just sing the songs, and, you know, the officers would come in and start doing it with us. And it was just, it was crazy. Like, what was happening in that place was crazy. Because in the jail, there's nothing to do but wait. You said that yeah. in the last jail. Or watch TV. You're or watch TV, it. yeah. But now, that which is why you all had time to kind of dig in. and. I felt like I had something to do. This movement happened, I Here's guess. what I need to do. I need to pursue this Jesus thing. And the only way I knew how to do that was to keep reading. Like, the more of the scriptures that I read, the more I knew I didn't know. So the more it made me want to, like, dig in and learn and grow. I remember the first time I really recognized, like, something is different with you, James K. Jones, was commissary that I got. Because you could spend, like, $30 or whatever. You had, like, it was like once a week you could fill out this little piece of paper and you could order whatever you wanted. I think you could spend $30 a week. But, you know, by that time I had been locked up almost four years. And I didn't, I was not really into sharing <laughs> like, I got I got to get mine. You figure out how to get yours. If I need something with you, I might share with you. But I remember that first commissary, I had ordered a lot of, you know, like food, soups, and Zoom Zooms and Wham Whams is what they called them. What is Zoom Zooms and Wham Whams? It just means stuff that you get from the commissary, like stuff that has value. Like food? Food, pretty much. Yeah, that was yeah. All, about all you had there. But, uh... That first commissary order that I got after that, I felt like the Lord told me to share with people. And I was like, share what? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I did it. I did it. And it was, like, liberating to me. Like, I don't have to I don't have to be all about me. It was like God was trying to show me how to kill my selfishness. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I didn't want to do it, but I did it. But I just remember thinking... Something's different. This is real. What's happening with you? Because you ain't going to give away your Swiss rolls, you know. Your Zoom Zooms and Wham Whams. <laughs> well, especially in Montgomery because they fed you. Like, that was probably, besides Jefferson County, the first one I was in, that was probably the worst food we ever had. Like, you pretty much survived off white beans. I mean, that was about all they had there that was worth eating. It was just so, like, clear. Like, there is something on the inside of me guiding me. That is showing me a better way. And what ended up happening over, you know, a couple, two or three months was, I don't even know what happened. It was just like (laughs) God just like breathed into that nasty jail cell. And we were like having like revival in there. So you said you, one of the guys said you worship and you should sing songs and he had these old school. Do you remember any of the songs? Oh, that was Darby. Yeah. He, Darby, w- yeah. he was teaching us, he would, t- he would just teach us songs. Um, I'm going to lay down my burdens down by the riverside, way down by the riverside. You know, just all these like <laughs> old African, and they were like so filled with like faith and hope and you know, I was just in a good place, even though my circumstances were probably worse than they ever 
had been. But then, like, when I would call home, like, my mom was like, you've lost your mind. I mean. <laughs> he is officially uh, snapped. <laughs> yeah, they thought I was crazy. And then, like, my stepdad or, well, whatever he was to me, like, he was married to my mom at one time. I don't think they were married at this time. He would, like, get on the phone with me and talk about, well, you know, everybody needs a crutch. So if that's a good crutch for you, just crutch it on. And I'd be like, no, 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 hold up, bro. I don't need a crutch. I don't know what you're talking about. But then, like, I remember having a conversation with my mom, my mom's mom, or really grandmother that raised her, that brought me up in the Free Will Baptist Church. I remember, like, telling her, like, just how excited I was and all the things that was going on. And then I remember, like, one of the first times I talked to her after this, like, she was telling me that she was worried about me because she always worried about me. And so I said, well, Mimo, you know, Jesus said we're not supposed to worry and that's actually a sin. Like, we're supposed to trust him, and then he's going to work it all out. And at this time, she was close to 90, <laughs> so she wasn't hearing none of that. <laughs> um, she was like, boy, what are you talking about? Don't worry. And I was like, it's in the Bible. Like, I'll show you the, I'll give you the address in the book of Matthew. <laughs> and you can read it so you don't have to worry no more either. Like, I thought it was so simple. And she was like, boy, what are you talking about? Everybody worries. The preacher worries. Even the preacher worries. And then she said, boy, have you become Catholic? <laughs> so I was like, what are you talking about? But from her perspective, like where she was from, the way she grew up out in the country, there were two religions, Baptist and Catholic. And you wanted to be a Baptist because that was the way to heaven. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying that's true, but that was the mindset. Right. And don't be a Catholic because they get to drink and gamble or whatever. Doesn't that make you want to be a Catholic? <laughs> <laughs> it would have would have me if I'd had the choice, but but at the time, I mean, that was her like that was her filter. That was her. So she was asking me, was I a Catholic? And I was like, Mimo, I'm not anything. I'm not. I'm not a Baptist. I'm not a Catholic. Like I've had an experience with Jesus, and she didn't really understand that. Like that was one of my joys of her being able to see that I was okay. And she was like, she was like, I can die now, my baby. You'd be all right. So that that was good. But uh, what I guess led from that, crazy what was happening there. But, like, the officers took note, and they would come in and pray with us and do all this stuff. And, you know, I didn't know how to pray. I didn't do none of that stuff. I didn't know any of that. None of us did. And I remember there was a, a guy that slept on the bunk next to me because, like, eventually you graduate up. When people leave, you can get a bunk. So eventually I got a bunk. His name was James Jones. And he was an old man, or older. No, he was old. He was real old. But he was uh, in there for, like, writing a bad check or something. I met so many characters in Montgomery County. They lock you up for everything in Montgomery. <laughs> I mean, one guy was in there for, uh, he rented a rental truck and didn't turn it in. And he was arrested for grand theft because he didn't turn it in. So I'm like dang, why didn't you just turn it in? And it was some story. But anyways, these people would be in there forever. I'm like, at least for me, like I had like a crime that I did. Some of this stuff was so silly, like it didn't make any sense. It actually solidifies my fear. I remember in college when I was first getting like my credit cards, my Gap credit cards. Gap. And I finally like confessed, came home because mom... My mom and dad were like, I can feel like something's wrong with you. What is wrong? <laughs> and I was like, you seem just very like stressed and tense. And I I thought that if I didn't pay my bill, which I didn't have the money to pay it, mm-hmm. my gap card, a little gap credit card, yeah, that they were going to take me to prison. <laughs> I actually really thought that. <laughs> well, lucky for you, you didn't live in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, Pensacola is probably a little more like. <laughs> No, my dad laughed, and they're like, you, "They don't take you to prison for not paying." I'm like, "Oh, thank God." <laughs> so you obviously were not paying attention in high school when they taught you civics. Like that's one of the reasons we broke away from Great Britain because they had debtors' prisons. But, anyways, that's a constitutional thing. But his name was James Jones, and he had a really bad infection, a, like an abscess tooth or something, and that he was like. Um, Those are painful. Yeah, I know, he was in pain, but they didn't care. They didn't do anything about it. And I remember like reading that Jesus said, you know, you can put your hands on people and pray for them, and he would heal them, and like praying for him to be healed. He like got better somehow, and then he got out. So I had this like thing, um, and it's the reason why I don't like cats to this day. <laughs> 
When I was 17, my cousin Lisa had two cats. They were little cats, but um, she got them from, like, the neighborhood. Like, somebody had some cats, and she got them. And anyways, her mom got sick and got swollen in her, like, something on her thigh where they thought she had cancer, my Aunt Patsy. And when they took her in to give her surgery, they realized that she had cat scratch fever, which, you know, I'd heard the song, cat scratch fever, dur, 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 dur. but that was, that's a real thing. Like if cats don't get their shots or whatever. And they said, you know, we need y'all to go in and like strip the house, bleach everything down because anything could like set that infection off in her again. So we had to get rid of the cats. And Lisa was, you know, a year younger than me, but she was like a sister growing up and I loved her. And they called the, like the, the dog catchers or the pound or animal control, whatever, to come and get the cats. And she was so distraught. She was like 16. I was like 17. And they came in with like these black gloves on that snatched the cats up. And she was so upset, just so upset. And I said, look, can I just take the cats and just put them in the little cage so she can not be crying? And they were like, yeah, that's fine. So I walked them out to where the cage was, and when the cats saw that they were going in the cage, they turned around and, like, scratched my face up. No, I mean, it was, like, <laughs> you would think that would be enough, but, like, six months later, my neck started swelling up. Go to the doctor. I mean, I remember telling my mom, like, I feel like there's a worm in my neck, and she was like, no, there's not. it's not a worm in your neck, but it was this hard little thing that just kept growing in my neck and I kept going to the doctor going to the doctor they couldn't figure out what it was so they put me in the hospital and they decided that I had cancer in my neck and they were going to cut me open and like they didn't tell me that though I was young they told my mom that but when they cut open my neck it was uh the same thing cat scratch fever it was in it was in a lymph node and that what they do is they like do something where they drain it Mm -hmm. but then they told me like be careful around like anything could like set that infection off again so at this time that had been like seven eight years later wow but i went through three and a half years of prison in florida and never had any kind of sickness um which was a miracle because they don't take care of you when you're sick like don't get sick don't go to prison to get sick especially if it's like some kind of condition because they'll like amputate your neck or something (laughs) but uh my, my neck started swelling up and I knew the feeling it was the same feeling I had then, and that scared me. I was so scared, and I didn't want to like tell the people because they were they were mean. The medical people they were mean. They always thought you're faking, right. you're making up stuff. But I made an appointment. I went and I told them, you know, I told them I had this. I, I still have the scar on my neck. You can see where I got operated on. They just were, like gave me some Tylenol and just told me to shut up. So I was scared, and this was like my first like answered prayer. Like where I just know that God answered my prayer. So I went to this brother that was a little bit older than me, and I just said, I'm scared. Like, I don't want this to come back and be in jail. And then, you know, I don't know what could happen to me. And so he, like, grabbed my hands and he said, you know, the Scripture says we're two or three, you know, agree. God is in the midst. He'll take care of us. So we prayed, and I believed he believed, and I believed he believed. (laughs) All things, you know, everything the formula said. And um, I thought I should be instantly healed, you know, because that's what happened. And that's what happened when Jesus touched on you. I mean, you know, you just was better. But I wasn't better. And it was almost like I was worse. And then um, it wasn't two hours later. This James Jones had left. He was gone. They said they called my name for med call and they handed me a pill and it was penicillin. And the James Jones that was there had an abscess tooth. And um, I was trying to explain that it wasn't me. Like, I, that wasn't my medicine. <laughs> and they were like, that James Jones. no, but the guy like got like, violent, like, you're James Jones. Like, he could see my name tag. And so, and they would make you take your medicine in front of them. Like, you couldn't just like walk off with your medicine. It was like some kind of control. They controlled everything you did. Mm-hmm. And I took my penicillin. And then I took it again the next morning, the next night, and then like two days later, I was better. But it was like I realized. It wasn't even medicine for you. It wasn't my medicine. But it was (laughs) penicillin for James Jones who had an abscess tooth who got out. (laughs) But it it like did something for me. It was like, okay, everything don't have to be like ooty booty, ooh, all that stuff. Like 
God was taking care of me. I needed some penicillin to knock that out, and it knocked it out. And I've never, I, I don't think I've ever had a problem with that since then. But it was like solidified for me, like this whole like following Jesus, praying, spiritual thing. Don't always have to be like ooty booty, like ooh ah. Or when you say ooty booty, I think you mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, some like emotional high that happens immediately, or just like an immediate miracle. And I don't mean I have seen miracles. I've seen yeah. God perform miracles. But in my life, more often than not, it was a process, something like that, where I knew, okay, he's doing this. I'm going to be fine. I just need to trust him, and everything's going to be beautiful. And it was. And whatever was in my neck got knocked out. They didn't help me. The medical people there in Montgomery County, they didn't care to help me. But Jesus saw where I was. And there was something about that that was so, I guess, like comforting to me to know, you know, I'm here. I'm locked up. I don't have my family, but God knows where I am, and he's taking care of me, and he did. And I never really lost that after that. That, I think for that, for me, like that part of it, just like being, I guess, like known and taken care of, and he was taking care of me. And then in the meantime, you know, what was happening in that county jail, I still to this day, I've never seen anything like that. I, I mean... And at this time, now I'm, what, 24, 25 years in? Well, if you could sum it up, what you say you've never seen anything like it, what was it? I mean, you say a revival, (laughs) but, like, I mean. It was like a group of 50, 60 men that had no hope, that were stuck in, like, the worst conditions, worst, you know, like, nothing was going to get any better, nothing was going to change, and somehow... That God chose to like come down to us and reach into us and take us somewhere different, and it was it was amazing. I mean, even the officers, it was like you know whatever's going on here, it's not this is not like normal Montgomery County Jail life. It was, uh, and I, I mean there wasn't nobody could take any credit for it because didn't none of us know what we were doing. <laughs> I mean, we did. It's almost like there, like from what you described, there was just like a breath of life. That was breathed into there. It was. And it was, uh, I believe it changed all of us. I mean, I know it changed me. It got me ready for what was next. And I had a guy that came through there that had been through some kind of program called Canaan Land outside of Montgomery. And it was some kind of faith-based like program. And I remember him telling me, you should go there and see him. So I was like, ooh, I'd rather go there and see him. And they were like, oh, my Okay, this is what we do. The scripture says, if you believe, you receive, you have what you say. So we pray one time, you believe, receive, and then you just say you have it. <laughs> and so I was like, okay. Like, how, like that sounds like something I would be interested in. <laughs> I mean, if that's all it <laughs> is to it, I mean, that would definitely be something, you know, I just, okay, I believe, I receive, and then I just say, okay. Easy enough. So he wanted, he like, grabbed a hold of me, want to do this prayer thing. And then we believed that we received when we prayed, and then we had what we say, so we just say it. So he kept saying, you're going to Canaan land. James is going to Canaan land. And, of course, I never went to Canaan land. <laughs> but I remember, like, getting, like, two or three weeks into that, and, like, I think you're missing, like, the thing. Like, that's not – I'm going to prison. <laughs> 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 so, long story short, they offered me 20 years. In Montgomery. Offered you? Or like, <laughs> Well, no, like in, in cases like that, you don't want to go to trial because you're already guilty. If you go to trial, like if they offer you 20 years, if you go to trial and lose, it's like a punishment in the criminal justice system. So if you go to trial and lose, that means you put them through a trial. They had to pick 12 jurors and do all, take all this time, spend all this money. So you ain't going to get 20 years. You're going to get at least double that. So if I don't went to trial and lost, I might got life in prison. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's a reality. And plus, for me, going to trial was not an option because I was guilty. I mean, guilty. There's no reason to um, no reason to try to go. I mean, I, I couldn't win anyways. So, he was real. My lawyer was real troubled. He, I th- he was a believer. And it was like he knew I was too. It was weird. Like, he knew. Like, he was, like, in my corner. He was for me. He was fighting for me. 
And um, he came back with a, a, a 10-year sentence. Like they're offering you two 10-year ten, two ten sentences. They'll run them concurrent, which means like I don't have to serve 10 and then serve another 10. I would serve one 10-year sentence, and they would give me credit for time served for all the time I did in Florida, which to me meant I'm going home next Wednesday because of good time and all that kind of stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we went to court. You don't have a guarantee when you go, but you have to go and you have to plead guilty, and then you just roll the dice. And then when you're getting sentenced, you can have, like, character witnesses. And I remember my mom came and, you know, a couple other people, but my Aunt Sue got up there and was just saying, you know, how I messed up my life and I made a mistake and, you know, it'd be great if I could have another chance. And then she just, like, started squalling. She was like, Judge, he got saved. He got saved, Judge. He's saved. He's saved. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, well, if that will make him do anything different, that would be great. But if it won't, then that was not necessary to say all that. <laughs> um, but he ended up giving me 10 years sentence and then credit for time served for my time in Florida, which meant I got almost four years time served, which meant – you know, I was only looking at, at the most, I was looking at six years. So here I was. That that process was not quite as long as it was in Florida. You know, when I was in Florida, it took me a whole year to go to prison. Yeah. This took me, I think I was in prison in, in, by Thanksgiving. So it started like July, August, September, October, November. I was, I was in prison by Thanksgiving. The difference for me this time was I was almost excited to go to prison. Like, just get me out of county jail. You know, I got this Jesus thing going on. God's got a plan for my life. I'm ready. Let's do it. Uh, I'm not scared. He already performed a miracle, and they're not giving me 20 years. Because they could have given me, like, 20 years consecutive, which would have been 40 years. And I was guilty. They had the evidence. They had everything they needed to know. And then, again, I'll say I couldn't lie anymore. <laughs> so it, yeah. was, it was a weird, like, helpless feeling. Like, you can't even, like, make up something to defend yourself to, like, deflect the punishment. What is it? You were just ready to pay the fiddler. Is that what yeah. the saying was? Yeah, if you're going to dance, you got to pay the fiddler. Yeah. So I was getting ready to go to prison in Alabama, and I guess that probably need to be where we need to end this one. Yeah. Um, during that process, you know, I had a case in Shelby County. I had to go up to Shelby County. I think I stayed in Shelby County overnight to get that case going up there. It was another armed robbery. Uh, the Shelby County Jail was way different than Montgomery County. It was, uh, I mean, all jails are depressing, but this one was like a a no contact jail. It was like everything, they did everything through glass, like they handed you stuff through these little cubbies. And you felt like you were at Disney. You, remember at Disney World, you'd ride by and you see the little people sitting in their houses and uh, going up Space Mountain? Mm -hmm. You kind of felt like that, like the police would come by looking at you. And then they would give you your food, and you would watch TV, and <laughs> it was just, <laughs> jail life sucks. <laughs> it, it sucks. Like, there's no, it's just, it's just hard, hard time. But uh, I was ready to go, and um, ready for what was next. And somehow I was, like, filled with faith, and I was not hopeless. I was not. I really wasn't even discouraged, which troubled, like, my mom and my granny and, like, people that are close to me. Like, you got to at least be bothered. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. You don't understand. You don't understand what I got on the inside. So the in, in part of 1996, um, headed off to prison in Alabama, and I guess that would be where we uh, start the next one. Yeah, because things get more dramatic, right? Not right away. Remember in Florida, I went to Lake Butler, which was the North Florida Reception Center. Mm -hmm. That was one of three in the state of Florida, and that was the roughest one to go to. That was the one where they beat you down, break you down, you know, do all that stuff. Uh, in Alabama, there's only one. It's Kilby Correctional Facility. It's a reception center. It's outside of Montgomery. It's the only one in Alabama, and it is not that intense. It's like... It's almost like a, like watching one of those old westerns <laughs> where you see the land that time forgot and, you know, you're going back 50 years. Oh, it was kind of like that. Hmm. And, it, I mean, it was prison, but it wasn't, um, 
they weren't trying to beat you down or I mean they made sure that you were submissive and but I would soon find out that not only were county jails not the same in Alabama as they were in Florida but prison prison was not either it was a totally different experience but uh we'll get into that in the next one good things coming stay tuned all right we'll see you next time thanks so much bye hey guys thanks so much for tuning in to the straight out of prison podcast for more exclusive content head over to our website timjones.co slash podcast yes you can subscribe by clicking on the become a patron button and that's going to get you access to our for real reel which is very different than the highlight reel reel. some very juicy content there good stuff or you can look us up on facebook and instagram straight out of prison podcast yes that takes the story to a whole new level where you can see some of the people that james talks about in his story and see some of the places that he's been i've been loving it and you will too prison recipes yeah all the things (laughs) good stuff (laughs) we'll see you soon guys thanks bye Bye bye-bye enjoying these videos please like and subscribe to page share it with your people put it on social media wherever you have people (laughs) getting anything out of these videos please follow the channel like and subscribe share it with other people put it on your social media facebook instagram whether you wherever you do social media that really helps us get the ball rolling and of course for more follow me on facebook and instagram look up chef james k jones thanks for joining me today this is uh the second episode in my basic series where i'm just teaching you some basics to cooking a delicious meal. Today we're going to be talking about the Trinity.